Okay, uh, I have 8.15. So um, thank you for those of you that are able to stay with us. Uh, we're now gonna change gears a little bit and move on to a pediatric topic, pediatric pelvic and femur fractures. Uh, my great pleasure uh, to continue this webinar series. As uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned in the last hour, we have the month of May booked with the following topics, including additional fractures next week followed by hip, scoliosis, and back pain. And uh, we'll sort to figure out these uh, platform issues, hopefully uh, this week sometime. And um, please uh, continue to join us for the uh, hand webinars. We have a whole month of May booked out for those as well on uh, Sunday evenings. So, so um, we have an excellent panel of uh, nationally recognized people on various topics, including uh, Craig Eberson, from uh, Brown University, who's gonna to talk to us about the physical examination of the pediatric trauma patient and a non-accidental non trauma. We have Marty Herman from uh, St. Christopher's in Philadelphia, Drexel University, who will talk to us about pelvis fractures. Nirav Pandya is gonna to talk to us about hip fractures. Uh, Tony Riccio um, from Texas Scottish Rite will talk to us about femoral shaft fractures. Susan Sherl from University of Nebraska will talk to us about distal femur fractures. Um, Ira Zoss from um, Michigan, uh, Children's Hospital of Michigan, will talk to us about AVN of the femoral head, and I'll close this out talking about compartment syndrome. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and ask uh, Dr. Eberson uh, to start sharing, and uh, we'll begin with the physical exam of pediatric trauma patient and non-accidental trauma. Craig, you're on mute. Better? Yep, we hear you now. Uh, just start sharing again. Yep, that's a good start. No worries. Let's see here. All right, let's try this again. So Josh, again, thanks, thanks for uh, organizing this. This has really been a great thing for the residents and, uh, and the rest of us here. So. Pelvic and hip fractures often occur as part of high energy trauma, so a thorough evaluation is important. Uh, and the orthopedic care of these injuries has to take place in the setting of an entire injury spectrum and as a collaborative effort with your trauma team. And then at the very end, we'll touch base a little bit on non accidental trauma, and that should always be a consideration in the injured child. So, the injured evaluation uh, of uh, this patient it should focus on identifying life and limb threatening injuries using ATLS protocols. Um, and everyone knows the ABCDEs. We start with our primary survey, airway, breathing, circulation, disability. Uh, neuro exam is important, uh, both uh, uh, in terms of the uh, CNS status. Is there a head injury, spinal cord injury, uh, and is there a lumbosacral plexus injury from a pelvic fracture? So all those are important. Exposure is very important. You have to see the patient, making sure the entire patient is exposed uh, and you're examining them for uh, injuries. Uh, and that also includes his radiographic screening. Your institution may have its own protocol in terms of uh, x-rays or CAT scans, et cetera, but making sure you have the information you need. And also you have to assess for hypovolemic shock. So, you know, we're all orthopedists. So uh, most of us have our own ABCDE, which stands for a bonus crack dude, excellent. A little bit different. So hypovolemia is gonna be the most common cause of shock in trauma patients. And you want to really avoid the triad of death. In general, anything named the triad of death should be avoided. So hypovolemia volemia leading to acidosis and subsequent coagulopathy uh, is a bad combination. So make sure they're inserting, inserting a large bore IV, Foley catheter, central venous monitoring in some cases. You may be the only one who realizes that this kind of heavy-duty pelvic fracture is really a high-energy injury, and everyone has to raise their game up a little bit. So there are a lot of trauma rating systems. I'm not going to go through all of these. Rockwood and Wilkins current edition goes through this really nicely. Um, they can be used both to triage patients as well as to predict outcome. You know, things like the injury severity score. Uh, I can't really figure that out without a protractor, an abacus, a textbook, and, and everything in front of me, but it's a combined score looking at all the different organ systems. Uh, the pediatric trauma score, you see that there in table 4-2 on the right. A little bit easier looking at the age and size of patient, and et cetera. And the Glasgow Coma Scale, which all of you know very well, that's very important when we talk about assessing the ability to clear the C-spine and uh, doing the neural exam. 
All right. So assuming this was not, you got a call rapidly to the trauma room for unstable pelvis and a hypotensive patient, you're going to have time to do a secondary survey. And you really want to make sure you go head to toe. Uh, any images that you need urgently for planning a fracture surgery can be obtained then, as well as any scans that would be uh, crucial uh, for decision-making processes. So the thing to remember, we see a pelvic fracture. You have a pelvic fracture and another long bone fracture. That's a marker for head and abdominal injury. And that's very important. Again, you may be the only one in the trauma room that knows this. So arterial injuries are really easy to diagnose, right? If you have an injury to one of the iliac arteries, there's no pulses. Those are easy. Venous injuries may only show up when shock is there. You, you know, you have a, a vena cava rupture or an internal uh, uh, iliac vein rupture. You may only diagnose this on laparotomy. And half of these injuries are fatal. So being aware of intra-abdominal injuries associated with pelvic fractures and long bone injuries may be your job. Okay, head injuries. Um, principal determination of the morbidity and mortality of the multiple injured child is going to be the head injury. So this is one thing that we really stress. Treatment of the orthopedic injury should proceed based on a presumption of a full recovery. We all have stories in our institution about patients who are comatose who will come back in two years later to say hi to all the nurses in the pediatric ICU. So don't ever blow off a fracture or accept less than excellent care, uh, obviously taking the patient status uh, into consideration uh, based on the assumption that they won't fully recur recover. And also remember that fractures hurt. So a patient with a, uh, a ICP bolt uh, where they're worried about intracranial pressure, you may need to do something to stabilize uh, a fracture either by splinting it or by putting on an X-fix or surgery just to keep that pain level down. C-spine clearance, a little bit beyond the, the, uh, uh, this, uh, this talk, but really the important determinants are age of the patient, the Glasgow coma scale, their exam, and any distracting injuries. And uh, Marty Herman uh, has a great paper a few months ago in JVJS, which really breaks down a great way to assess the cervical spine. I recommend everyone look at that. But essentially, you need a, a, a patient who's older than three or four who's awake you can examine that doesn't have some horrible injury like a pelvic fracture uh, and every institution has its own protocols but you know i want to focus on it's really important to demonstrate any movement that's you know patient has a low glasgow coma scale but they're moving spontaneously again bad pelvic fractures often will involve the lumbosacral plexus and trying to sort out the difference between a spinal cord injury and a lumbosacral plexus injury is important uh, and again, this comes up on uh, in-training all the time, spinal shock versus neurogenic shock. Spinal shock is an injury to the spinal cord, absence of a vulval cavernosis reflex. Neurogenic shock is bradycardia and hypotension, two different things. All right, open fractures, not to dwell on these, but make sure, you know, the most important thing really is appropriate antibiotics and tetanus. Uh, so for first and uh, second grade uh, fractures or first gen generation cephalosporin, like ANCEF is helpful, grade three and above, aminoglycoside and a farm injury at penicillin. Uh, and again, these can be managed with quick IND, or you can go to the OR if possible, uh, and definitive debris and stabilization when the condition permits. But remember, you have to really look for these and factor this into the overall care of the patient. So now kind of delving into the pelvic-specific exam, uh, you know, hemodynamic instability in the unstable pelvis is what we all worry about, uh, the phone call. Uh, and really, I like to, there's many fracture classifications here, and you'll hear about some of them later. But really, I like to throw a down and dirty application of a typical adult classification. Either the pelvis is a grade A stable, it's a, it's a grade B, it's rotationally unstable, something that if you wrap a sheet or a binder and tie it tight around the pelvis, you're going to decrease the volume and help tampon on some of the retroperitoneal bleeding versus one that's vertically and rotationally unstable, type C pelvis, and that may need some traction as well. All right, skin integrity is important, not just the obvious, um, but look for rectal, rectal or vaginal bleeding. These are open fractures. The morbidity and mortality from these are exceedingly high, particularly with missed diagnoses, so look for that. Also look for Morella Valley lesions. These might affect your pin placement if you're gonna plan on an external fixator. All right, neuro exam, we mentioned that. It can be difficult with a concomitant spinal cord injury. You can have a plexus injury from vertical displacement, so if you see that in the x-ray, make sure you document that carefully. You can also have sciatic nerve injury. And remember, if you have a neurologic injury where sensation has damaged the extremity, it may make detecting compartment syndrome very difficult later. You can't rely on pain. So be aware. We even sometimes will do serial pressure monitors in the swollen leg just to make sure we're not missing something. And we already talked about other long bone fractures to alert the team to the risk of closed head injury or abdominal injury. Quick case, 11-year-old female presents in hemorrhagic shock. Uh, after polytrauma being struck by a car. And this is not subtle. Hopefully everyone realizes this is an open pelvic fracture. She also had a, a pilon fracture 
and some uh, uh, foot and ankle fractures. So this is a fracture, and you can see both the uh, open book nature of this, uh, the Raymeyer fracture, and also it's unstable posteriorly with superior migration of the hemipelvis. So again, you go to the operating room. This is a combined approach. While the surgery team is doing external uh, an X-lap and, and uh, kind of addressing the intra-abdominal injuries and the bowel injuries, the GU team is addressing uh, the bladder injuries. Uh, vascular team is evaluating her, and uh, ortho is getting a quick X-fix on. Um, get the X-fix on, get the pelvis some semblance of normal, get it packed, get her off the table, all right? You get a CAT scan post-op to look at the abdominal injuries. You can see there's still significant displacement of the uh, pelvis, you know, but that's okay. You take her back and, uh, you know, do definitive fixation, including the external fixator. And luckily this girl, you know, after a month or so is still doing okay. Um, but it the take home point of this is that uh, these are heavy duty injuries and be, be prepared to work with your trauma colleagues. Now just to briefly uh, touch on non-accidental trauma, Orthopedists are involved in about half the cases, and if you looked at unrecognized non-accidental trauma and the child goes back home, about 25% of them will show up with another injury and 5% of them will die. So really important to look for this. All right, so what's a suspicious fracture? One where the mechanism doesn't match the story. You know, you have bilateral femur fractures from a fall down one step, that doesn't match. Femur fractures in non-walking children. Posterior rib and scapular fractures and sternal fractures, and fractures of multiple stages of healing. So a spinal fracture, non-weight-bearing child, like the femur on the right, uh, fractures in multiple stages of healing we mentioned, and corner fractures, and you can see that in the, with the uh, arrow there in yellow, and these are posterior rib fractures. Right, so how's a corner, corner fracture happen? This is a pulling and twisting injury, and a little tiny corner of the metaphysis breaks off. So this might be read as a chip or an avulsion by the radiologist, but you and I know better. So something like this is pathognomonic for a abused child. Uh, other findings, burns, bruising. So anyone who has children, I have three boys, they're covered in bruises, but they should be on the extensor surfaces when they fall down on their elbows and knees, not on the flexor surfaces. Ligature marks, marks on the buttocks, these kind of uh, bruising in children under one. And when there's a uniform shape suggesting they're hit with, a, with the same object over and over, that should prompt worry. All right, differential diagnosis, OI, metabolic bone disease, clog disorders, leaving a bruising, et cetera. This can be very difficult to sort out. So the take home message here is involve your child protection team early. They are experts in this. They can help you with the scalable survey. They can, they can be non-judgmental. And, and you know, the, the goal here is to tell the parents that you know, uh, you'd rather uh, be uh, overly concerned and, and then miss something, right? So um, be aggressive here. And remember your notes will be brought up in court. If a parent is, is disputing an abuse charge and you say the fracture is not consistent with child abuse or that it is, that will get brought up in court and you will go to court. So do not opine, just say what you see and make sure you document everything you see. Thank you guys very much for listening and I look forward to the rest of this webinar. Great, thank you very much, Craig. Great job and a uh, hard topic for a period of time. Uh, we're going to move on to some more about pelvis fractures uh, from Marty Herbin uh, from Philadelphia. Hello, everyone. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to be part of this. And again, as everyone's doing, a shout out to Sarah and Josh for such great work with us. Uh, I'm going to try to complement uh, basically where we started off with uh, Craig's talk. Uh, let me get my slides going here. Can you guys, oh, there we go. So this is a relatively rare injury, about one to 2% of fractures. But if you look at trauma admissions for children, to, especially to pediatric trauma centers, five to 10% of them have a pelvic fracture. And if you look at morbidity and mortality, a lot of the kids who die or who have serious injuries also have associated pelvic fracture. Now, the difference between a child's pelvic fracture and a adult pelvic fracture is really what I'm going to try to teach tonight, because the majority of these are very different. A dramatic case of a, of a blown apart pelvis, those are rare as can be in a child's, uh, in a children's hospital. And really what we're mostly dealing with are, as you'll see, avulsion fractures and stable fractures. So our outline will be a little bit of anatomy, classification system, where I'm going to go through with the modified Tarot and Zieg classification. We're going to talk about treatments based on that, and then some of the complications that may or may not be unique to kids. So I'm a Philly guy. I got my Eagles hat on. I'm talking about pretzels and thinking about them. So the pediatric pelvic ring 
is more like a soft pretzel than a hard pretzel. And what does that mean? It means that it doesn't need to fracture in two places to have an injury. Most of these are low energy. They're stable fractures. They're non-surgical because the ligaments are a little bit stronger. The bone is a little bit more porous. And these cartilaginous growth plates allow for some mobility that the adult pelvis doesn't have. The adult pelvis, on the other hand, is defined really, I think, best by looking at the triradiate cartilage. So whenever the triradiate cartilage is close to closing or closed, regardless of the child's chronologic age, that probably is the time to think of that as an adult pelvis. And as you know, and I'm not going to harp on adult pelvic fracture management, but they are a different animal, uh, especially when it's an unstable ring. So Craig alluded to this, but this is a, a well-known concept. Uh, this particularly refers to a femur fracture, but this concept holds for all the major traumas that we see in kids. Kids, depending on their height, get struck in a different way by motor vehicles, for example. And while the direct blow to their body is probably where some of the fractures occur, and certainly the head injury might occur, the, the contralateral sort of smashing into the concrete or into some other vehicle is probably where some of the other injuries occur. So we see in association with pelvic fractures in kids, about 50% of the time, other fractures, most commonly lower extremity. We also see head injuries in 30 to 50% of kids, and they can be as mild as a concussion all the way up to a traumatic brain injury. And then a smaller number of kids have thoracoabdominal abdominal injuries, but as Craig pointed out, you have to go looking for them because sometimes these kids show up and they don't look so bad. So we classically learn uh, as pediatric orthopedists the Tarot and Z classification, which is basically four types. One are avulsions, and we'll go through these in detail, but two is iliac wings, three are stable ring fractures, and four are unstable ring fractures. So I just skipped. Ben Shore and the group at Boston Children's modified this a little bit because while we recognize that this is a fairly easy classification to use and well applied to children, there seem to be a middle ground in this type three group where the front ring and the back ring can be fractured in, in, from A to B. And that turned out to be a, an important signal that the kids were more injured if they had a type three B than a three A. So we'll talk about that too. The other thing unique about kids is they don't get acetabular fractures in a, in a way that you would imagine that they do in adults. Because if their triradiates open, it almost functions like a physis and they get Salter Harris type fractures through their acetabulum. The key question that always appears on tests is once you anatomically reduce this and get it to heal, if the triradiate cartilage prematurely closes, acetabular dysplasia can develop. So just remember that as an aside, as part of the potential questions that might arise from this topic. Adult classifications, certainly we apply, and I like Craig's idea of trying to make it as simple as possible, but we do use the Burgess and even the Letournelle language to describe complex pediatric and adolescent pelvic fractures. And I think mostly it's because we often collaborate with adult orthopedic surgeons who do trauma for us. Um, and, the, and the common language really helps us, I think. So patient evaluation, I won't harp on this, um, but uh, to give an example, Craig mentioned this. You may be the only one in the room who recognizes it. The last unstable pelvic ring fracture was a girl that we had at St. Chris who was hit by a FedEx truck. The, uh, she was admitted to the floor because no one appreciated that she had an unstable ring injury. So you need to be aware that they can have cardiovascular instability, they can have neurological injuries, and their APCs and all those other things need to be taken into account. In kids, we still see some of the similar things that you might in adults. So this is a child with a morel lavalle lesion. You know, I, I always show pictures of people trying to show compression and rocking of the pelvis. Probably in a kid, you could do more harm than good. So maybe one person establishes that there's an injury and the rest stop rocking the pelvis. The radiographs are all similar, so I, don't want, I won't harp on this, but we, we do use inlet outlet views, we use uh, Jude views and uh, cysto urethrograms when we consider a urethral injury, similar to adults. Um, the CAT scan, even though we don't love radiating kids as much as we do adults, the CAT scan turns out to be an important thing for us because the, the morphology of the fracture pattern can't really be described or, or outlined in any other way in, in surgical planning. Uh, as well as any associated fracture patterns that we don't appreciate on plain x-rays need to be identified before you go to the OR. So let's go through the Tarot and Zyg. So this is, if I'm asking questions to you on a test, a lot of them should be geared toward these simple ones. So these are avulsion fractures, type ones, okay? And then, the, and I, I just, I, you can go back and look at this later, but each individual muscle that inserts or takes origin on these avulsion areas creates these fracture patterns. These are mostly non-surgical with few exceptions. So if the, AS, the AIIS pulled off by the rectus 
encroaches upon the, the labrum or the acetabulum, that's potentially a surgical one, but most of these are non-surgical. If the hamstrings have pulled off the ischium more than about two centimeters, that becomes surgical. Otherwise, these are non-surgical. Type twos are stable, uh, I'm sorry, type twos are iliac wings, and, uh, and I can only count on one hand. The, the last kid I had at St. Chris was someone who had a, a, a handlebar impale him. Um, these are relatively uncommon. Um, they're mostly in kids, again, stable fractures and just need to be treated symptomatically. Not always, because sometimes this fracture line extends down into the SI joint. The type 3A is the one that's probably the one associated with the, the higher level trauma and the most common one we see in level one trauma patients. This is the one where the anterior ring has been injured. Um, it can have, as we'll go back in a second, some posterior uh, injury, but these are stable pelvic fractures. So the majority of these do not cause anything more than a little pain and discomfort. The dilemma is they are a harbinger or a, warn you, a warning sign that some other serious injury may have occurred, so be careful when you see them. And then if I'm going to ask a question on a test, I want you to know Ben Shore's paper that said if they get a 3B type to road injury, their hospital stay is about three times longer and their transfusion rate is about two times longer because there's something about this injury, even though it's a stable ring by definition, that is more serious than this ring. Now, do we see these? So I, I, don't, I won't harp on this, but I, uh, Craig did talk about this a little bit. We do see unstable pelvic ring injuries in children, and we do see hemodynamic instability. But as soon as we fall into this category, I, I really feel like you need to apply your adult principles. So get away from thinking about them as kids. And whatever you think you would do for a pediatric patient with an adult pelvic fracture pattern, you should do. So we do use binders, we use X-Fix. Again, we try not to, we use embolization and, and pelvic packing. All these fall into our armamentarium, but they're really not that commonly applied to be perfectly honest with you in a true pediatric pelvis. Here's one of my patients, a six year old struck by a bus. Um, and this is a, uh, going through, this is a C by Dr. Uh, Eberson's classification. It's, it's vertically unstable. He wound up Winding, uh, he, I had my adult trauma surgeon come over, and, and it's not just our theory, but there's papers published, this is the most recent one, that if you treat pediatric and adolescent pelvic ring injuries like adults, then they do very, very well. So anatomic reduction, multidisciplinary approach to bring your adult surgeon over, stable fixation of both the front and the back, and if you can preserve growth, then do it. So either X fix or remove the hardware or do something that might allow for some growth if you can do it. But in the end, you need to keep these kids alive and get that pelvic ring anatomically reduced and stable. And then remember the complications. So a malunited pelvic ring in a kid causes a leg length discrepancy if there's a, tor a rotate, uh, I'm sorry, a vertical uh, pattern of instability. If there is an SI joint or an injury that were an a a incongruity of the SI joint, they get arthritis there. They, have, they can get incongruity of their acetabulum and get hip arthritis. And in general, they, have, they can get a pain syndrome just like adults. Other injuries to remember, the most common associated injury still remains a traumatic brain injury. We do see lumbosacral plexopathy, so it's critical that you do a full evaluation and separate out, as Craig talked about, some of the other neurological patterns that can happen. And kids don't as commonly get neurological injuries, but it's not zero. So again, some of the similar principles you apply to adults, you need to apply to kids. So in summary, these are uncommon and the morbidity is mostly from associated injuries. We like to use a modified to rodent's eye classification. And most of these remain non-surgical, but displaced injuries should be treated like your adult uh, patients. Thanks, Josh. Great. Thanks, Marty. Uh, again, uh, uncommon, difficult fractures to treat, uh, but certainly something we all need to be aware of. So we're going to move out west to California to near of Pandia. Um, who recently has a yellow journal on this topic of hip fractures in children. Uh, so thanks for joining us, Nirav. Great. Uh, all right, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, as I'm talking, I'll be talking about hip fractures in the pediatric population. Once again, thanks for uh, everyone for organizing this. Um, so in general, with these injuries, they are typically rare. They make up about 0.3 to 0.5% of all pediatric fractures. And the typical age range is about 10 to 13 years of age. There's a risk of serious complications and long-term disability, and if you look at some of the studies, it's about 20 to 50 percent for all comers with these uh, hip fractures. I think the important thing to know, particularly for the residents, is that you have to really understand the anatomy of the proximal femur, and particularly the blood supply. And ossification of the proximal femur starts around seven weeks of gestation, 
But the key thing is that there's no communication in terms of the blood supply between the metaphysis and physis until physial closure. So that places these injuries at a very high risk of developing osteonecrosis and vascular complications to the proximal end of the, of the, of the femur. And if you look at the epiphyseal blood supply, this is a question you may see on, on your in-training exams. The epiphyseal blood supply is basically the posterior superior branch of the LFCA, the posterior inferior branch of the MFCA and the retinacular vessels. Um, so it's important to have those preserved. And you can imagine a fracture in this region can lead to a high rate of osteonecrosis. And just like with the first two talks, these are generally high energy injuries. About a half of all proximal femur fractures will be from high energy trauma. There's a lot of associated multi-organ injuries. So just as the other speakers mentioned, it's important to look for the other things that could be causing other systemic issues besides the bone. And 29% of these injuries will be displaced on presentation. And just like with your adult patients, these patients are going to come in with a short externally rotated limb. Um, obviously, you want to look out for skiffies as well, too, but this is going to be your typical hip fracture presentation. You want to start with your apple, excuse me, AP and lateral pelvic films. If you're not sure or you're concerned about anatomy, you can get a CT. And you want to typically get an MRI only really for your atypical patterns or if there's a pathologic fracture, which I'll talk about. So that's really not something that we typically recommend for these injuries. In terms of what fractures are considered atypical, um, anyone that has a low energy mechanism, such as someone who's just falling, they're walking, they get the fracture, they have some degree of antecedent pain. Um, and things that are gonna cause this are your unicameral bone cysts, a malignancy, fibrous dysplasia, osteomyelitis that is missed can cause this as well too, metabolic bone disease, osteogenesis imperfecta, and stress fractures, particularly in female athletes, which I'll talk about at the end of the talk. This is an example of a uh, MRI image that once again shows what a, a typical uh, femoral neck stress fracture, stress fracture look like in a female athlete. You can see the edema there uh, in the inferior aspect of the femoral neck. Now the classification of these, which is the Dalbay classification, really guides treatment and it's anatomically based, which makes it very easy to, uh, to remember. It's also important because this anatomic classification also can help you counsel in terms of complications and each subsequent type has less risk of osteonecrosis, which I'll go over. And this risk of osteonecrosis has to do with the fact of where the fracture is in relation to the vascular supply. So the more likely the vascular supply is gonna be damaged, the more likely you're gonna have osteonecrosis. And this is the, the Del Bay classification. This is from our Yellow Journal article that Josh mentioned. A type one is a transficeal fracture um, with or without dislocation of the epiphysis. Type two is a transcervical. Type three is a cervical trochanteric and type four is an intertrochanteric. And the important thing to note that as you get further along in the classification system, the risk of osteonecrosis decreases, which is the important thing you can um, let parents know and the patients know when you see them down in the emergency room based on what their fracture pattern is like. Now, in terms of the timing of fixation, Unlike the adult population, the pediatric literature is a little bit unclear, uh, whereas in adults, you want to get to these as soon as possible. Um, the literature in kids is not as, not as clear. If you look at some studies, they say there's about a four to five times higher rate of osteonecrosis if you let them wait greater than 24 hours. But if you get to them too quickly, less than 12 hours, there's some studies that suggest it increases the rate of osteonecrosis. So what I take home from that is that you want to get these hips reduced as anatomically as possible, as safely as possible. So that means that you wait till seven in the morning when there's a fresh team and you're fresh and you can get to these uh, in an appropriate fashion. That's important, but it doesn't mean holding it off, you know, for a day or two to get to them. So do it when you feel safe and you feel you're optimized your outcomes in the treatment of these. In terms of closed versus open reduction, it really depends on the fracture pattern and your skill of getting a closed reduction. Uh, most of the displaced fractures will have to get an open reduction. I like to do these on a radio lucent table, uh, but some people will use a fracture table. Um, you always start with an attempted closed reduction, but if it's not anatomic, then you def definitely want to move to an open reduction. And then your approach for an open reduction can really vary based on uh, you know, the fracture pattern and what you feel comfortable with. You can use a Smith-Peterson, which is what most typically is used, but sometimes you have to use a separate incision to get your screws in. You can use a Watson-Jones or a Harding approach as well, too. So whatever approach that allows you to get to the femoral neck and get your fixation in uh, is important. In terms of actual fixation, um, you're really balancing the risk of physial injury and in creating a premature physial closure versus getting stability. So in, t in, in general, what you want to do is you always want to make sure that you have a stable uh, injury. Um, you want to make sure you have fracture stability uh, in, in lieu of worrying about the physis. We can always do stuff with the physis later, but if the fracture doesn't heal, that's a problem. But in general, if it's less than 10 years of age, you want to spare the physis. If it's greater than 10 years of age or poor stability, you can go transficeal. And if you do go transficeal, you want to keep your screws less than five millimeters for the subchondral bone of the femoral head. In terms of putting your screws in, you want to avoid posterior perforation. 
you want to avoid screwing the anterior lateral quadrant of the epiphysis to prevent vascular injury. And you can also use smooth wires in the picture here as well too, particularly if you have a young patient or you want to add some supplemental fixation that you want to take out potentially at six to eight weeks after the injury. This is an example of a Del Bay 1 injury. You can see it the um, kind of, it's almost like a, a bad skiffy. Um, you can see that that comes off very high rate of osteonecrosis. You put your transpiceal screws in and you can see even with good fixation, the vascular supply probably was disrupted and you can see osteonecrosis developing just three to, you know, three to four months after the injury. This is a Del Bay 2. Once again, the CT scan demonstrates that. You see screws placed in. Um, and once again, even with anatomic reduction, you can see how osteonecrosis develops very quickly with that type of injury as well too. And this is your Del Bay 4, where you can use more of a sliding hip screw type construct for these with a screw, um, a little bit more like your adult fixation options. And these have a much less, uh, much less of a risk of osteonecrosis. Um, and you can treat them more in an adult type fashion, not have to go across the physis. Postoperatively, a lot of it depends on the fracture pattern and patient compliance. Um, you may or may not need to use a spica cast, particularly in older patients. But if you do have a young patient, older patient, or maybe non-compliant, you can place them in a spica cast. Typically, you do six to 12 weeks of non or partial weight bearing. And then some of the adolescent patients may need PT as well, too. I think the biggest thing is that there's a high risk of complications with these. So besides understanding the classification system, it's understanding the risk of complications. Osteonecrosis, I mentioned, is the most common, somewhere between 20 to 29 percent. And it's thought to be due to vascular injury at the time of the fracture. This typically occurs seven to eight months after the injury. And as I mentioned before, as the fracture is more displaced, there's an increased risk, as well as the Del Bay classification increases the risk as well too. There's conflicting data about how to prevent this. Some say you can do capsular decompression. Some say you can use different fixation methods, timing, et cetera. I really think this has to really do with the fracture uh, pattern, the Del Bay type it is. There's not much we can do to prevent it besides getting an anatomic reduction. You wanna follow these kids until skeletal maturity. You can get an MRI early on to catch early cases of osteonecrosis. So you can start to limit weight bearing. There's this Ratliff classification, which kind of helps to describe the, the degree of osteonecrosis. But really the important thing is the treatment really depends on how bad it is, how much collapse you have in their age. You wanna start with anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, and limit their activities. A lot of these kids can surprisingly be managed with activity limitation until their adult years. Other complications to know about, septic arthritis with any kind of hip operation is an issue. Um, Non-union is a risk. There's about a 10% risk, and type Del Bay type 2 are the most common. Cox of error can also happen as well, too. Premature fascial closure is an issue, both with the injury itself and with fixation. Um, an MRI can be obtained to look for a fascial bar, and you really treat that based on your expected leg length discrepancy. And there's also a rare complication that can happen as well, too. You can get a post-traumatic skiffy or femoral neck overgrowth. This is typically in your type 2 and type 3 fractures. And uh, this typically happens due to kind of a, a stress riser at the area of fixation within the femoral head, um, the epiphysis falls off. And just like the femoral shaft fractures, you can get overgrowth because the injury is um, kind of stimulated by the fracture itself as well too, so the bone grows more. So you have to look out for that as well too. Really quickly in terms of atraumatic insufficiency fractures, which are much more rare, much rarer, excuse me. Um, these are typically stress fractures and athletes who are involved in repetitive activities. Usually this is teenage females. Um, you can get compression fractures on the inferior aspect of the neck versus tension fractures on the superior aspect of the neck. With all these patients, you want to order that endocrine metabolic workup to make sure that there's not any underlying bone issues, particularly vitamin D or thyroid issues. Typically, where most of these fractures are compression fractures, you limit their weight bearing for a period of somewhere between um, six to 12 weeks. If it's a tension-sided fracture, it's not healing. You can treat these with screws. But typically, the main thing is to counsel these patients to stop running. So really quickly, in terms of our top 10, these are a rare injury. Long-term sequelae are common. The important thing is to understand the blood supply to the proximal femur, because that really guides the complication risk. These are typically high mechanism injuries as the rest of the talks we'll be talking about today. The goal is really to achieve fracture union and reduction while avoiding osteonecrosis. You choose your open reduction pattern based on uh, the type of fracture that you have. Fixation stability is more important than physio preservation. Get the fracture to heal and we can deal with leg line discrepancies later. The Del Bay classification guides treatment and your prognosis. Osteonecrosis is the most common complication followed by Cox of era, non-union, and physio arrest. And you really want to work up your atypical fractures and counsel patients to stop activity, particularly if they are endurance athletes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nirav. So we're going to move on to uh, femoral calf fractures uh, by the man, the myth, the legend, Tony Riccio. You got to mute, Tony. There you go. Okay. 
I hear you. you. Hear me? Yep. Now I hear you. All right. Let's try this again. I apologize. Uh, new computer set up here at the house. So here we go. Share screen. Do this. Share and. All right. We see you. Well, I'm having technical. Oh, there we go. Okay. Jesus Christ. All right. We good? Josh? You're good. Um, maybe go to presentation mode, though. Oh, am I not? Uh, what are you looking at now? I did. Oh, sugar. I'm doing a. Uh, I'm doing a two screen thing. Hold on. I don't even know why it's doing that. Sorry, didn't mean to one be the one to screw this all up. How's that? Is that regular view for you? No. Maybe go out one more time. Really? That's not because I'm background. seeing my regular view, dude. Stop share one time. Stop share. All right, hold on. I got to do that. Make, Make sure, sure the PowerPoint's open in the background when you start share. Click the PowerPoint, not your desktop. Okay. Um, Stop share should be at the top of your screen. Yeah, I'm trying. It says new share. And it, it's this one. No good? No good. There you go. You're out now. Okay. Make sure your PowerPoint's open in the back. Hit start share and then click on the PowerPoint. Okay. Did it? There you go. All right. Hey, I apologize to everyone. I'm usually not this dumb. Actually, I kind of am, but, uh, you know, I get away with it usually. So, hey, thanks, Josh, for organizing this whole thing. I appreciate you having me on board. Uh, it's, it's a hell of a panel you put together here. Uh, Josh asked me to speak about fractures of the femoral shaft, so kind of moving down south from the femoral neck. And uh, I figured I'd kind of give you my thoughts on an algorithm based on age and fracture stability. So I didn't know if we were supposed to include disclosures or not, but they're really not uh, pertinent to this talk. The real disclosures are right here. And the truth of the matter is, is that there's simply really no accepted treatment algorithm for pediatric femur fractures. And in essence, there are really very few wrong ways to manage these injuries. So for you residents out there, if your staff's hassling you or telling you this has to be done this way, this has to be done this way, they're probably being dogmatic and all you need to do is justify the approach that you think should be taken and you're probably gonna be just as right as they are. Truth of the matter is, is the preferred treatment of these injuries is really often based on local custom and local um, implant inventory. You need to keep that in mind uh, if you go into peds uh, and um, you know where you're taking your job and what they have available to you to help fix these things. And honestly, uh, as you can see at the bottom, um, you know, I don't use a real algorithmic approach to treat these things. I've definitely managed some of these the wrong way, I think, in retrospect. And I personally am a complete slave to local customer, what we have available to us at Scottish Rite that's not necessarily available everywhere else. So, you know, let me start by stating the obvious. And, and the obvious is that, you know, this two-year-old polytrauma patient with this femoral shaft fracture is completely different than the seven-year-old who fell from the bike and has a low energy uh, mechanism injury. And that patient has a completely different clinical entity that they're presenting with than the 13-year-old with developmental dis uh, delay and a comminuted distal third femur fracture with a butterfly fragment. These are all pediatric femur fractures, but they're all completely different clinical entities and need to be treated differently and thought about differently. And so this is what you see when you open your Miller, or when you open your AOS, you look at the yellow journal, you see these basic treatment guidelines kind of based usually off of age. And we tell you, hey, zero to six months, put these kids in a pavlik, their femur's gonna remodel, no matter what you do, it's gonna turn out straight. 
six months to five years, start thinking about putting a spike of cast in. You can usually mold it adequately enough. Again, there's plenty of time for these kids to remodel and they're not gonna have issues with malunion or deformity secondary to these injuries. Once you get into the five to 11 year age range, we start talking about flexible intermedullary nailing, which for many years now, I would say is the gold standard of treatment for kids in this age range. And then once you get over 11, that's where you start thinking about rigid intermedullary nails, typically because these kids aren't necessarily older, but they're heavier and have greater deforming forces across what might be a more flexible construct if you were to fall to flexible nails. But as I've lectured many times, for those who have heard me talk, age really isn't the only factor to consider. In fact, I think it's one of the least important factors to consider. And so when you consider how you're going to treat these things, we kind of, of course, need to fall back on the, educate, on the, the literature that's available to us and the evidence-based medicine. And so, you know, in 2009 and then again in 2015, folks at the AOS, like really smart folks, much smarter than I am, got together and reviewed all of the evidence-based literature, the good stuff, the level two, level one evidence medicine to kind of decide what we really knew about the treatment of these injuries. And they sorted all the literature out and kind of put together a series of recommendations uh, and then told us how good or how poor the literature was supporting those clinical recommendations. And they were able to make a couple of recommendations, but the truth of the matter is, is only two out of the 14 or so that they made actually had a good level of evidence to support them. And those were, as Craig already talked to you about, is that kids kind of less than three with femoral shaft fractures, you really got to think about the potential for non axonal trauma. And that spike at casting, might be a reasonable option if a child's between the age of six and five months and is less than two centimeters of shortening. For all the other recommendations they made, the evidence backing up decisions to use, say, submuscular plating or flexible nails or an external fixator or whether or not the rod should be removed once the fracture is healed, all either had poor or inconclusive evidence. So remember that when you go and you're thinking about what's right and what's wrong. There's really not a lot of uh, literature out there guiding us in that regard. So I think young kids are the easiest to think about, those less than five years. Weight really is less critical in this group. Even if they're chunky and kind of fat, you can still usually get a good mold around a spike of cast. And a spike of cast is the gold standard, I think, for children this age. We can treat both length stable and unstable fractures adequately in a cast. Uh, and there are both kind of the traditional casting options, the one and a half spike at cast like we use at Scottish Rite with the knees more or less flexed that don't allow the child to ambulate. And uh, the, there's been a new trend that Jack Flynn's published out of Chalk, uh, Chop, the use of walking casts, uh, allows kids to get around and improves uh, parental satisfaction. Those casts do have a higher um, rate of the need for cast modification mid-treatment and uh, by virtue of our resources and how painful it is to put these things on, we still choose to use the traditional cast, but walking casts can be used with success and CHOP has certainly shown that. Obviously, you can't automatically default to this. Uh, a spike cast might be inappropriate in a patient who has polytrauma with you know, thoracic or abdominal trauma and you can't have something circumferential around the abdomen or thorax if they have se uh, severe skin breakdown, skin rash from being ejected from a, a vehicle or altered sensation when you're thinking about, uh, worried about skin breakdown and whatnot, uh, sitting in a spiky cast, are all things you have to take into consideration when you uh, employ the truth. My partner, uh, Brandon Ramo, really smart guy, uh, kind of looked at gray zone kids. So those kids who are four to five, and there are certainly advocates out there who feel that these kids should be nailed. It's easier on the parents, they get up, they move their knee better, there's less of a chance of stiffness. Those who advocate spike a cast say, hey, you're doing a surgery unnecessarily. And so Brandon kind of compared these two and basically proved that in that gray zone area, that uh, four to five year old age range, uh, and there were several kids he actually studied in a smaller cohort all the way up until age six, they basically all had similar clinical and radiographic outcomes. So this is just something you can use to educate the parents and involve them in decision making. I personally think that you know having a kid in a cast can be really difficult. It's probably a little bit of a higher burden of care on the parents, uh, maybe a little bit of greater frustration for the child. 
But at the same time, if you can spare them an incision, a surgery, a second surgery, remove nails, you might be doing uh, what's in the best interest of your patient. Uh, for school age kids, you got a ton of options here, right? You got flexible nails. Again, I still think that's the gold standard at a lot of institutions for length unstable fractures. Submuscular plating is the way to go. Open plating certainly has its role, especially in polytrauma patients when you just got to get something stabilized very quickly. And we still will use external fixation, albeit usually ring external fixation in our institution in certain um, polytrauma patients, typically older patients with very severe uh, soft tissue injuries associated with their fractures. Um, so for those school age kids, those five to 12 years uh, old kids, I think age is probably less important than other factors such as how uh, heavy they are and, and their ability to deform a flexible construct. Fracture stability, which I think is critical to think about, you have to consider canal diameter because whatever you put down there, uh, say it's a ridge nail, say it's a flexible nail, it has to be small enough to fit. And then you have to think about the available implants at your hospital and what you yourself are adept at doing. Of these, I think patient weight and fracture stability are probably the two most critical. This is what how I kind of break down fracture stability. You look at the fracture on the left and you see that's a transverse fracture. You put those together, you apply an axial load and it's not gonna shift or move. Uh, the definition of a length unstable fracture is that the length of the fracture line is greater than two cortical diameters at the isthmus of the femur. So if you measure up and it's greater than two cortical diameters, it's length unstable, you throw in a flexible construct without any distal or proximal interlocking options, and the fracture can actually slide over your uh, fixation construct, which can oftentimes, if you use flexible nails, push the nails out through the distal incisions, which is a problem. Um, again, I still think flexible nailing is the gold standard. It's certainly uh, my go-to. Consider weight. There's a lot of controversy about how heavy we can go with these nails. Um, there are several studies uh, that have shown that regardless of whether you use titanium nails or use stainless steel nails, they can still be used very successfully up it, upwards uh, of kids who are you know, close to 120 or even 130 pounds without higher rates of complication uh, in comparison to rigid nail constructs. But uh, it's difficult to kind of look at these studies, and I, I was involved in the study uh, on the, um, the Shea study in JPO in 2018. Uh, you really have to make sure that the studies control for length stability because it's those length unstable fractures that are gonna deform under higher loads that these heavier kids apply. There's a myriad of studies that kind of warn us that you know for length unstable fractures fixed with flexible nails they have much much higher complication rates if you are going to use flexible nails for these injuries you got to make sure there's some cortical abutment and if you have the ability to lock your nails distally which not everyone does you can probably eliminate shortening i will tell you that some biomechanical studies looking at the caps that go over the Synthes titanium nails have shown that they actually don't impart any axial stability whatsoever. So if you're thinking that's going to do the job for you, uh, just think again and maybe consider a supplemental spike at cast. So what do I do? Um, you know, you have this seven-year-old with the low energy length unstable fracture and, and, you know, you could flex nail it, you could use a submuscular plate, you could open it, you could do a rigid iron nail spike cast. I think all of these are appropriate options. As Scottish Rite, we're fortunate enough to have these stainless steel enders nails with eyelets where I can lock with the two seven screw distally. And this does a beautiful job holding this out to length. But the truth of the matter is, is any of those answers are absolutely right, depending on your level of skill and what you have available to you. Submuscular plating is perfectly appropriate as it rigid I am nailing in the uh, right situation. Now, once you get to older kids, older than 11 or 12, especially heavier kids. Once they get over 55 pounds, that's when I really start thinking about using rigid nail constructs, especially if the fracture is length unstable, because you're gonna lock this proximally and distally and it's gonna hold you out to length. Now I will tell you, we push the envelope quite a bit for length stable fractures, like this transverse fracture in a 14 year old 62 kilogram hurdler. And you know this was treated with flexible uh, stainless steel nails. Now stainless steel uh, nails, if you have the ability to use them, do confer more bending rigidity than titanium. We've shown that in the uh, biomechanics lab. Uh, 
But if you have ability to use them and it's a length stable fracture, you can use that in the right patient and have a very nice outcome with an easier surgery and no disruption of the abductors and these older kids who tend to be athletes. So this is the algorithm, how I kind of break these things down and think about them. Kids less than five get a spike of cast and those five to 11, if they're less than 55 kilograms, I ask myself, is it length stable or unstable? If it's length stable, it's automatic flexible nails. If it's length unstable, I personally will use stainless steel nails, which are locked distally, but if you don't have the ability to use those, something else you're plating or a locked rigid IM nail or flexible nails with the supplemental spike, spike cast is a perfect option. Once you get to kids greater than 12 years old or certainly greater than 55 kilograms, start thinking about using a rigid IM nail and understand you have to vary this treatment algorithm based on whether the fracture is very proximal or very distal and whether there are under other injuries associated with polytrauma. So thank you very much. Sorry for all the technical issues there. No problem. Thanks, Tony. Uh, great summary on uh, femoral shaft fractures and children adolescents. So we're going to continue our move distal, and I'm going to uh, welcome Susan Sherrill from Nebraska, who's going to talk to us about distal femur fractures. I'm going to, I may have the same problem that Tony was having. Let's see if I can find how to make this big. Uh, maybe top left, Susan, view. That's good. If you can get rid of that right side. Uh, I wonder if I can, if I do this, will I get rid of it? Hmm. If not, we can see it pretty big anyway. Okay, cool. I'm going to talk about pediatric distal femur fractures. Uh, huh. Can I move? Hmm. Ugh. This is not working. Now I can't. Let me try something else. Um, Someone says if you hit play, it should where, work. Where is play? I don't uh, see. Top it. left to your mouse. Up. Over to the right. Either Down way. a little. It's okay. There. there you go. Okay, there we go. All right, now that's working. All right, so disclosures. Um, so facial injuries around the knee, and that includes distal femur fractures as well as proximal tibia fractures, which I'm not really going to talk about, are relatively rare. Together, they only account for somewhere less than 6% of facial injuries in children, and they're described by the Salter-Harris classification. And uh, since it hasn't really come up before, I'm just going to go through it really quickly, even though I know most of you know it already. So the type 1s are through the physis, the type 2s are... Uh, enter through the physis and exit out through the metaphysis, and the metaphyseal fragment that's connected to the epiphysis is called the Thurston-Holland fragment. Type threes come through the physis and exit down into the joint through the epiphysis, and type fours straddle across the physis and include both metaphyseal and epiphyseal uh, segments. So the goals of treatment in any Salter-Harris fracture are pretty much the same, and in general, we're going for restoration of the growth plate in children with at least two years of growth remaining and restoration of the articular surface in those uh, type threes and fours. And so in general, the treatment guidelines in broad strokes are that for ones and twos, you can often do a closed reduction in casting or closed reduction in some sort of percutaneous fixation. And for threes and fours, you're going to need to do an open reduction because you need to line up the joint line perfectly and then either fix that percutaneously or with uh, a standard internal fixation. As you probably know, Salter-Harris fractures are more common in children than ligamentous injuries because the physis is weaker in a child than, uh, than the ligaments are. So in this slide, you see the example in the adult, you know, this person underwent sort of a valgus stress and it tore their medial collateral ligaments. In a child, uh, that collateral ligament is going to stay intact and the distal femoral physis is going to open in that location. Um, Non-displaced Salter-Harris 1 fractures can present with negative x-rays. Um, they can be non-displaced and you won't see them on an x-ray. You need to maintain a high index of suspicion. So if the child is tender over the physis, assume that's what's happened. 
So I always get, and this is true of all pediatric fractures, you always want to get at least orthogonal views in lateral. Um, you can get extra views, obliques, or contralateral comparisons as needed. Um, when I was a resident, if we were concerned that we had a non-displaced Salter Harris 1 fracture, we were told to get a stress radiograph. So we'd go in uh, to the, to the x-ray suite and we'd stress the limb and see if the physis opened up in the x-ray. We don't do that anymore. It's painful. It's sort of a pain in the neck for everyone involved. And it's adding an additional injury and insult to that physis, which is already sort of stressed out. So we don't need to do that. You can go clinically. If you think the kid is tender there, just treat it as a presumed Salter Harris 1 uh, fracture based on those findings. Physical exam for all of these uh, Salter Harris fractures of the distal femur are going to be similar. There's going to be pain, a knee effusion, inability to bear weight, deformity, tenderness. In Nebraska, where I live, um, they're all from football. Um, they may be from other things where you guys live. The main thing to remember about these is that these fractures have a guarded prognosis. Uh, this is a very touchy place. It doesn't respond well to being injured, and the incidence of premature growth arrest here is high. And you have to warn the family of that early on, you know, at the time of the injury. Mechanism is usually hyperextension. Sometimes it's a fall into a hyperflex knee. This, uh, like uh, proximal tibial Salter Harris fractures, is a childhood analog of a knee dislocation. Um, so just like in an adult knee dislocation, you wanna really be cognizant of the bundle and potential for neurovascular injury, and you wanna make sure you can feel the pulses, you may wanna do ABIs, you really have to be looking for that. If you are called to see the child in the ED and they have a not perfused limb or a pulseless limb and an obvious deformity, it's okay to right then and there in the ED and see if you can reestablish perfusion. Um, and if not, you're going to go straight up and do something quickly, but, but that's not a bad thing to try uh, down in the ED if necessary. So the Salter Harris 1 fractures, they can be completely non-displaced, just a little tenderness around that area, and if that's the case, treat it in a long leg cast. Some people like a pelvic band for these. Um, I typically just use a regular long leg for four to six weeks, and your incidence of growth arrest is gonna be pretty low. If they're displaced, like the one you see here, um, these need to be treated with a closed reduction and cross pinning, and the incidence of growth arrest is gonna be pretty high here, up to about 40%. So this is another example of one of these displaced ones. The reduction maneuver, perform it under general anesthesia. Straight traction, a little bit of flexion or extension, uh, depending on which way the fragment went, usually it's flexion. Um, need good relaxation. You have to, you know, remind your anesthesiologist to really give you some uh, 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 relaxation and uh, be relaxed for you, paralyzed. So for these soldier hearts ones, you need to cross pin. You have to cross the physis to get this stable. You want to you don't want them to cross at the fracture site. And what you see in this picture is sort of traditionally described. These are retrograde pins. They start just posterior to the midpoint of the condyle, and you aim 10% anterior. Um, and that's kind of what that looks like. You can bury the pins, or you can leave them outside the skin. I almost always bury them now. Um, if you leave them out, these get really soupy, and it's just nicer to bury them and go back for them in about four weeks. That said, I do almost all of these in an antegrade fashion now. I like it a lot better. Um, it's slightly more technically difficult, not really very much, and this avoids violation of the knee joint, and it also gives you a lot more real estate to bury the pins in than that other approach does, and, and so I almost always do these uh, anterograde now, and I like it quite a bit better than doing them retrograde. Salter Harris 2s, you're going to do a close reduction and percutaneous pinning. You're going to put pins or screws parallel to the physis through that Thurston Holland fragment if it's big enough. Uh, if you're using screws, they don't have to be bicortical. This was a very young child who I just did some pins in, but more typically in an older, bigger child with a big Thurston Holland, you're going to 
put in a couple of big cannulated screws. So these were two kids that came in just this last month, the same night. Uh, these look pretty similar, but you'll notice the one on the left, the Thurston Holland fragment is medial. The one on the right, the Thurston Holland fragment is lateral, which is really more common and slightly easier to deal with. Um, so I took care of these two slightly differently. Um, the child on the left with the medial based uh, Thurston Holland was a little smaller and the Thurston Holland fragment was a little small. You used five cannulated screws and used three of them. In the other child, it was, she's bigger and she's got a little more room there. I used six, five screws and only used two. Don't hesitate to open a Salter Harris one or two if you can't achieve an adequate reduction closed. In a Salter Harris two, if your reduction is being blocked, you want to open on the side opposite the Thurston Holland fragment. There's going to be a piece of periosteum stuck in the fracture there that you're going to need to flip out. For the threes and fours, you're going to do an open reduction and internalization. You need to have that joint line lined up perfectly. Um, you're going to get pins or screws in parallel to the physis across the epiphysis, and you want to avoid crossing the physis if possible. The complications here, uh, again, you want to check for neurovascular injury in the acute setting. Uh, because you don't want to miss that. Um, growth arrest, about 40 to 50% of them go on to it. So you want to warn the parents and follow closely. And in the picture there, you see a child has gone on to a growth arrest. Uh, and they're either going to need an epiphyseal seudesis or uh, lengthening, uh, depending on uh, how much growth there was remaining when the injury occurred. And knee stiffness start range of motion pretty early. Occasionally, those cannulated screws uh, get a little prominent as the um, metaphysis kind of cones down with remodeling and if they become prominent on the opposite side and are bothering the kids just remove them. So distal femoral physeal fractures in particular have a high rate of post-injury premature growth arrest. You want to maintain a high index of suspicion uh, for that and follow them along and also maintain a high index of suspicion and a low threshold uh, for treatment of a physeal injury in a growing child with history of trauma and knee effusion and beware of neurovascular injury and compartment syndrome. And that's it. Great. Thank you very much, Susan. Very informative. And I think we always all learn, each other, learn something from each other, uh, which I certainly did from that. So we're gonna move on to uh, eye results. Uh, I was gonna talk about some uh, techniques for uh, preserving the joint up at the hip region from AVN that we heard about earlier. Can you hear me, Josh? Yes, we can. Josh, thank you very much for organizing this. Everybody really appreciates your efforts, especially in these difficult times. So it's a pleasure to talk to everybody tonight about uh, AVN, and this is just an introduction to AVN, uh, especially how it applies to kids. Oops, my slides are not advancing. There we go. These are my disclosures, not pertinent to this talk. So tonight we're gonna talk about the etiology of AVN, how we uh, stage it nowadays, what factors we consider before treatment. And then we're gonna go over by way of example, a variety of treatment options and the results to expect. Uh, again, focusing on a younger age group. So we, we've already discussed this tonight in uh, Nirav's talk and we understand the vascular supply to the upper femoral epiphysis and femoral head and it derives primarily from the medial circumflex artery. And we know that disruption of this blood supply will lead to necrosis and whether the where, where, how, and to what extent the blood supply is disrupted really uh, informs the uh, degree of AVN and the size of the lesion that we're, we're forced to manage. So if the artery is blocked extra osseously, say from trauma, you can get whole head involvement, whereas if it's blocked intraosseously, you might only get partial involvement. We've all learned about the etiologic factors that are involved in developing osteonecrosis, of course, trauma, which we're talking about tonight, is a very common cause. We also see it following infections of the hip, various embolic phenomena. It's possible to get it, at least theoretically, by tamponading the circulation to the upper femur. And uh, depending upon how we manage it and how we insert our nails, we could also um, cause it ourselves. There are systemic factors known to all of us. Alcoholism is the classic. Corticosteroid use, we see this a lot in our, our um, kids with malignancies, chemotherapy as well. The malignancy itself, especially if it involves the blood, can cause necrosis and various blood dyscrasias like sickle cell uh, can cause an embolic type phenomenon. 
And these pathomechanisms say, share similar features, uh, especially with the end result blockage of arterial circulation and uh, resultant necrosis. So what are the prognostic considerations when you're faced with evaluating a child with osteonecrosis? We have to look at the lesion size and depth, how collapsed the lesion is when we initially see the patient. Something we don't talk about a lot, but is very important is how much cartilage is delaminated. In some of these lesions, we see tremendous cartilage delamination, which is a very difficult uh, anatomical problem to manage. The etiology of the osteonecrosis is also quite important as it informs what things we can do and helps us decide on morbidity of treatment. The age of the patient is also important. With the younger people, we tend to be a bit more aggressive. And what patient comorbidities exist, size of the patient, prior surgeries, and other concurrent medical problems also help and factor in the decision making. So let's talk a little bit about lesion size and depth. I will tell you that if you look at a localized, very superficial lesion with significant chondral delamination, that can be much worse than a very, very deep lesion where we have a lot more bone to work with. So I'm gonna show you some examples tonight of how this uh, affects treatment. The size of the lesion has typically been um, um, assessed using Kerbel's method, which was initially uh, described with an AP and a frog lateral of the hip and is now typically done on the MRI scan, on the, on the mid-sagittal coronal, and the mid, excuse me, the mid-coronal and the mid-sagittal uh, views. And we try to uh, assess the degree of angulation on the coronal and on the sagittal views and add those together. Lesions that subtend an arc of less than 200 degrees typically have a pretty good prognosis and they're relatively straightforward uh, to manage, whereas Lesions that are larger and, and subtend an arc greater than 250 degrees typically are much more difficult to manage, especially with osteotomy. And then of course, we, we use an MRI to assess the degree of collapse. And I'm sure everybody is familiar with FECOT's classification. Basically, a, a, a early stage AVN is MRI positive, no plane radiographic findings. The first thing we'll see on the MRI and then eventually on the plane radiograph is a crescent sign, which is a subchondral fracture. And then as the bone on either side of that subchondral fracture resorbs, the lesion will collapse and uh, eventually the hip will become arthritic. And so a stage three is when there's just femoral sided disease and the stage four is when there's both femoral and acetabular sided disease or the hip is essentially arthritic. So this is my treatment matrix. I think in a kid, the treatment, uh, the decision making is much, much more complicated than in an adult. First of all, the kids have a lot more to lose by uh, doing prosthetic treatment and uh, kids have a much higher healing potential. So I tend to preserve the joint in the younger kids with more local disease and we uh, opt for more adult-like treatment methods, primarily arthroplasty, when the lesion size is big, when the kids have systemic diseases that preclude their ability to tolerate preservation type techniques and when they have a lot of comorbidities. And, kind of where the kids fall on this scale uh, helps me to decide and talk to the parents about what the best treatment is for them. So I think the best way to understand the decision-making and thought process is looking at some examples. This is a 19-year-old male who uh, came back from his freshman year in college where he was doing a lot of drinking. He had a lot of hip pain and the x-rays don't look so bad, but if you look at the MRI, he has a pretty large lesion. He already has significant joint space collapse and femoral head deformation, a substantial amount of chondral delamination. And this is really not a salvageable hip when you see that the hip is already subluxed intraarticularly. And this patient went on to an arthroplasty even at this young age. In contrast, this is a 14-year-old boy who was treated by one of my associates for sepsis and he had a really bad septic hip and we were suspicious that he might develop AVN. We followed him with serial MRIs and at the first uh, positive sign of necrosis, which you can see in the bottom right, we did a uh, BMC injection and two years post-op, his head does not look totally normal, but it has not collapsed and he's uh, gone on to enjoy pretty normal hip function. And in the in the young patients with a pre-collapse disease, uh, BMC has a very good uh, 
rate of hip survival, about three quarters of those hips can be, can be uh, saved by uh, bone marrow concentrate injection. What about intertrochanteric osteotomy? This was the mainstay of treatment for many decades. It actually has very good results, particularly with the more localized lesions. We see this most in pediatric orthopedics following slipped epiphysis, where we can see more localized anterior superior lesions. And if the corbal angle is less than 200 degrees and the patients are otherwise healthy, these types of uh, lesions will do very well with a simple reorienting osteotomy, particularly uh, after Skiffy. So this is a typical example of someone who has anterolateral watershed AVN and already some collapse and following a flexion osteotomy of probably 40 degrees where we bring the viable portion of the head into the weight bearing zone of the acetabulum, the, um, the lesion will heal, it won't collapse further and the hip can really be saved. So there's a lot of literature on this and it's a very, very good technique for smaller contained lesions, particularly anterolateral lesions. We still use free vascularized fibrillar grafts on occasion. This is a young girl who's 13 and a half. She sustained a hip dislocation on a trampoline and uh, she was referred after uh, she presented with uh, recurrent hip pain. She, she already has a FECOT1 lesion with a visible subchondral fracture and some early collapse. Now this is an example of a very, very shallow lesion. And there are many ways to address this. You can uh, probably do a trapdoor procedure. You could probably use oats grafts to try to uh, revascularize this. But the other, what we've had very good luck with in our institution, also substantiated in the literature, is a vascularized bone graft. And uh, we do this with a surgical dislocation. Uh, and we open up the lesion, we prop it back up and support it with a vascularized graft and remove as much necrotic bone so that she has an intermediate lesion, fairly large corbal angle, which would predictably do poorly without some sort of treatment. But based upon her age and her healing potential, we uh, use this vascularized graft and it prevented further collapse. And there's a large series of young kids from Duke and these kids have a pretty low failure rate when assessed in aggregate. And I think in these young kids who have a lot to lose, this is a very good option to remember. And you can work with your plastic surgeon or if you have somebody in your department who knows how to do these, they're um, oftentimes very useful procedures, which again, we combine with a surgical dislocation nowadays to help restore the shape of the head. And uh, the last option for treating these types of kids is a rotation plasty. Uh, the, these are really sort of Hail Mary type operations. This is a young boy who had iatrogenic AVN following an arthroscopy. And you can see he has a corbal angle of over 300 degrees and uh, the posterior inferior head remained vascularized. And really the only way to potentially save this is to do a Sujioka rotation plasty, which is a extensive operation. And uh, if, the, if about a third of the inferior epiphysis is still intact and you can rotate, you can rotate the dysvascular region out of the weight bearing zone uh, by um, anterior translation, then th these have a relatively good success rate. The hips don't look normal, but they, they don't collapse further. And the principle is the same as uh, intertrochanteric osteotomy where we're trying to take the collapsed lesion out of the weight-bearing zone to uh, restore integrity to the, to the remaining bone and, and prevent a further deterioration of the joint. And uh, this kid did pretty well with this, but again, this is a pretty uncommonly uh, required operation. It's a very technically difficult procedure. So in summary, Really early diagnosis is essential. And if you have a patient who's been treated for a hip fracture or somebody who has bad sepsis, uh, really the, you really wanna keep an eye on these hips very closely. We do quarterly MRI scans. And if we see signs of AVN, we try to treat it very early. For those patients who, treat, who present later in the course of the disease, we have to look at the size and grade of the lesion, understand what else is going on with the patient to uh, understand the natural history. And what I would like to leave you with is that osteonecrosis in an adult usually means a total hip replacement, but kids have much better healing potentials and even relatively advanced FECOT hips can be preserved. The hips may not look well, 
but they can function very, very nicely for many, many years and delay the need for hip arthroplasty. Thank you very much, Josh. Great, excellent. Thanks, Ira. Uh, definitely an issue following some of the fracture patterns we saw earlier. So I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, thank you for hanging in there and sorry again about the um, issues with regard to uh, switching platforms. Um, but hopefully it looks like at least those here obviously made it. So um, it's working well. All right, so I'm gonna take us home on a, another complication issue of compartment syndrome. And then we'll be done for the night. So I think we all recognize that compartment syndrome is a condition in which there's an increased pressure within a closed space and that ultimately compromises the circulation and function of the tissues within that space. And it's important to note that this is different than Volkmann's ischemia, which is defined as a condition of decreased blood flow, really ischemia to the musculature specifically of the volar form. And the causes of Volkmann's ischemia are most common compartment syndrome, but certainly not always. This can occur due to improper use of an arm tourniquet, a brachial artery injury, or just arterial spasm. So the etiologies of compartment syndrome can be broken down to two broad categories, one being a decrease in the size of the compartment, uh, and the other being an increase in the contents of the compartment. And the compartment size can certainly decrease by a tight bandage uh, or splint or cast, or localized external pressure, such as lying on a limb, or closure of fascial defects. And the compartment contents can certainly increase due to bleeding or capillary permeability or the common uh, reperfusion that we are all aware of following a uh, vascular repair. Despite all that, fractures are certainly the most common cause of compartment syndrome in both the adult and pediatric populations. And the incidence of the uh, compartment syndrome is directly proportional to the degree of injury to the soft tissue and bone. When we talk about adult compartment syndrome, we're all familiar with the P's, with pain out of proportion being the most uh, problematic and um, pain on passive stretch of the compartment likely being second as far as um, predictors of compartment syndrome. And the other features really appear quite late. However, this is very different in children and this is because the exam is quite difficult to obtain and can be fairly unreliable, particularly in a fright child or a child that won't follow commands or can't talk. And if you're gonna try and obtain pressure measurements, particularly in a wake child, that would be extremely difficult to do. So a common or easy uh, test question could be, what is the best predictor of pediatric compartment syndrome? And it's not the pain and passive stretcher or any of this other stuff, and hopefully everyone knows that it's increasing analgesia requirements. And really this came out of the paper from Boston, from Don Bain, colleagues, um, several years ago that looked at compartment syndrome in a group of 33 children. Here you can see that the lower leg is actually the most common site for compartment syndrome in children, at least in this study. And the study looked at 23 compartment syndromes diagnosed on admission and 10 genetic diagnosed with compartment syndrome while admitted to Boston Children's Hospital. And they looked at the classic signs and you can see um, a lot of them had pain, but they didn't have the other P's that are commonly seen in the adults. And I looked at the number of P's present um, it was a pretty low numbers of uh, maybe two or three, uh, but certainly not all five. And they did do pressure measurements in 20 of the children. This utilized a clinical diagnosis in uh, 15 of the children. And what they ultimately found out of the 30 children, uh, out of the 33, did restore a normal function following recovery from their fasciotomies. And this was despite a fairly long time from the injury to the time to the orthopedic evaluation and certainly the uh, treatment of it. What was most interesting from the paper in this series was that all 10 children diagnosed in Boston Children's had an increasing analgesia requirement. And this was noted from increased amounts on the PCA or nurse administering uh, pain medication. And this increase in uh, narcotic use really preceded the development of the other signs or uncontrolled pain by uh, seven hours. So, um, this is uh, certainly important to understand um, as you consider compartment syndrome in children and that this increasing analgesia requirement is likely a more sensitive indicator of adult developing compartment syndrome in children.
and therefore um, fasciotomy should be performed in any child um, that is diagnosed with compartment syndrome because ultimately uh, the results are excellent despite uh, even a delaying diagnosis. With that said, this uh, test question certainly can pop up. The best initial treatment for a pediatric patient in a splint for a distal radius buccal fracture that returns to the emergency department with persistent pain. And here, hopefully everyone knows that we can just remove the splint again. If the splint is too tight, it's gonna decrease the uh, space available in that compartment. And the first thing we should do is remove the splint or tight dressing and see if the symptoms resolve. And then if not, if we think it's a true compartment syndrome, despite our initial efforts, then uh, proceed to the operating room. So we'll talk about some specific pediatric fractures. Tibia fractures, I mentioned in that study as well as others, is the most common etiology for development of compartment syndrome in children. Um, and this is particularly associated with edema and a vascular injury. And it's important to note, just like in adults, can occur in both closed and open fractures. And then the proximal tibia fracture, which we'll talk more about next week as we talk about fractures in the knee, but this area has a high propensity for compartment syndrome. And therefore, when, as uh, Susan, Dr. Cheryl talked about earlier, these are somewhat analogous to a knee dislocation. These children are admitted for observation to ensure that they don't develop compartment syndrome overnight. I would say the only caveat is the uh, toddler who can get a buccal fracture in this uh, region uh, is the one that can certainly be treated and discharged but certainly any school-aged child and above, uh, this is a higher energy mechanism. You need to be on the lookout for a development of compartment syndrome in these fractures. Again, the uh, key to diagnosis is increasing uh, pain medication requirements, but physical examination uh, a little later on the diagnosis of a child who's cooperative uh, may have decreased sensation of first web space if the anterior compartment is involved or pain with passive stretch if the deep posterior compartment is involved. And then certainly, besides the fasciotomies, you want to make sure that we stabilize the fracture. And um, again, just like the femur shaft and the fracture type, there are lots of different options available to stabilize the fracture. There is an interesting um, scenario um, regarding compartment syndrome after uh, spica cast placement for a femoral shaft fracture. Uh, traditional teaching was to place a short leg cast prior to um, the wrapping up above the knee, and uh, people would pull on the short leg cast to get for the femoral shaft fracture and then place the remainder of the uh, spica cast. However, the indentations from the uh, fingers during the pulling and can make the cast tight, leading to compartment syndrome of the uh, leg. Um, therefore, the technique that should be used is to place an above knee cast, so a long leg cast with the knee flexed, and then once that cast is hard, you can pull uh, gently on the long leg cast to obtain the length necessary to reduce the femoral shaft fracture and then wrap the remainder of a spica cast. Compartment syndrome with supraclinal humerus fractures is always talked about, but it's actually uh, somewhat rare. It's less than 1% of all supraclinal humerus fractures. This can occur with uh, humerus fractures that are casted in hyperflexion, uh, particularly uh, those without fixation. If there's a substantial delay in reduction, this can certainly occur. Uh, excessive manipulation can lead to increased swelling and compartment syndrome, and then an associated vascular injury. The keys to diagnosis are uh, being aware of a median nerve neuropraxia, any uh, sort of floating elbow, such as an associated forearm fracture or distal radius fracture, and obviously a dysvascular upper extremity. The treatment, again, is to stabilize the uh, fracture and then proceed with your four. Uh, uh, typically for a, vol for a form uh, compartment syndrome, you can start vorally and then assess the uh, mobile wad and the dorsal compartment um, as needed, but if there's any concern, uh, when in doubt, release more. Forearm fracture compartment syndrome, uh, sorry, compartment syndrome associated with forearm fractures is uh, relatively rare. The uh, etiologies can include a crush injury, again, or a constrictive cast or splint, but there was a study from about a decade ago that showed that it can be associated with I am nailing a form fractures in up to 6% of post-operative patients. And really this is associated with excessive manipulation in the operating room. If you can't get the uh, I am nails to pass uh, in a closed manner after a few attempts at reduction, you should really proceed to open reduction instead of the continuing to pull on the arm. And then I'll just end uh, with uh, 
the case of the treatment, uh, for anyone that may have missed it, Scott Cozen showed this case as well uh, a few weeks ago. Um, but compartment syndrome uh, cannot always be so obvious. So here's a Montasia equivalent or a radial neck at least um, fracture that's uh, substantially displaced in this four-year-old child that had a closed reduction and was uh, treated well. And the uh, treatment, um, once compartment syndrome develops, six months later, it's been missed. The child has finger tenderness, ten tightness and uh, nerve symptoms is this, um, is a um, flexor pronator slide um, where you'll elevate the musculature off of the uh, radius and ulnar nervure aspect uh, all the way down to the IOM, release it off of the IOM and allow the musculature to slide distally all the way down the entirety of forearm. And uh, this child wound up with a great result following that. So in conclusion for uh, compartment syndrome in children, keep a high index of suspicion. Remember the classic P's are unreliable in children. Assess the pain medication requirements. As soon as you suspect compartment syndrome, you should treat it. Um, don't measure, perform fasciotomies. They're uh, safe, effective, and uh, reliable. It's really the uh, only treatment for compartment syndrome um, when it's performed in time. So thank you again for uh, staying on tonight. I know we went a little late. Um, and thank you for your uh, flexibility, especially our panelists, uh, for jumping to this different platform. And we'll be sure to communicate next week on uh, what platform the pediatrics will uh, be on. Uh, but we'll be doing fractures about the knee and working distal to the foot. So I hope everyone has a great night. And uh, take care and be safe. Thanks, Josh.